Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this exciting event that you're attending today. My name is Valerie Oderomara. I'm the executive director of the Center for Urban Health Disparities Research and Innovation at Morgan State University in Baltimore. And I'm also the head of the RCMI, which stands for Research Center for Minority Institutions, funded by uh, National Institutes of Health, which is in part sponsoring the seminar we have today. It's also sponsored by Ascent Program, which is also funded by NIH, the School of Computer, Mathematical and Natural Sciences at Morgan State, Morgan Cares, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, the Alzheimer's Association, and the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center for Minority Aging Research. So today's event is the third in a series of educational programs that are the result of collaborations between multiple groups at Morgan State University and Johns Hopkins. Together, these programs are designed to increase community awareness on topics related to aging, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias to provide information about treatments for individuals with memory loss and to help highlight the importance of diverse participation in research. So I'd really like to welcome you and hope you get a lot out of this session today. So I'll hand it over to Christine, uh, Dr. Christine Holman. I'm not sure if Dr. Yu, our provost, is present yet to, to pass his greetings along, but we'll go ahead. Yes, good afternoon or good morning or good late at night, depending on where you are right now in our listener space. And it's really exciting to have you all here. And I'm really happy to introduce our speakers for today. Um, as Boris explained, we are looking at exercise on the aging brain from various perspectives today. We're going to have a scientific presentation by Dr. Laura Baker first, that will be followed up by a practical perspective from a practitioner um, who's worked with individuals um, with brain aging before, and that is Dr. Timothy Gribble. And then we will wrap it up with hearing a personal perspective from a former caregiver who has seen herself um, what exercise can do to help. And um, then we will have a question and answer session at the very end where people can um, ask their questions, but I would also like to encourage that you put your questions into the chat as you are going. Okay, so um, thank you very much for being here. And let us start off with our first speaker, Dr. Laura Baker. Okay, uh, do, do you want me to get started? Okay, sorry, I, I uh, was trying to answer Sorry, I need to introduce you, Laura. Okay, uh, okay. My task here. Uh, Dr. Laura Baker is a professor of internal medicine, neurology, and public health sciences at Wake Forest University in um, North Carolina, um, in Winston Salem, North Carolina. She is an international leader in the areas of cognitive aging and lifestyle interventions to protect brain health and prevent cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Dr. Baker has been an investigator on numerous multi-site studies examining whether regular exercise and healthy lifestyle changes can protect against cognitive decline in older adults. So we are thrilled to have you here, Laura. And I think with that, please start. Okay, thank you everyone. And I appreciate uh, having your attention just for a little bit. I'm gonna share some things with you that we've learned in the last, oh, 20 years, but really focusing on what we've learned in the last couple of months. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. All right, let me see if I can actually get this thing to work. Oh, there we go, it does work. Uh, oops, one more time. 
Okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today, how can I get rid of all these pictures on the side for a moment? Um, I don't know. It's okay. I'm just going to put them off to the side. All right. So today what I'm going to do is just talk to you about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and that is um, how we basically how we take care of our bodies uh, and therefore our brains uh, and how that care of our bodies and brains um, can uh, we're learning through science that it may actually prevent cognitive decline and dementia. So my question for you, is it worth the sweat? All right, um, I'm funded by these folks, uh, the government, uh, your tax dollars, uh, and the Alzheimer's Association. And uh, actually, none of what I'm going to tell you about could be possible without their really generous uh, support of our work. Okay, so this is a article that came out in the Wall Street Journal in November of 2019. And I was it was a, a centerfold uh, in the Wall Street Journal, and I was just so thrilled uh, because this was the first time uh, I had ever seen such a prominent uh, article about what uh, what we can do in terms of how we can alter our or make healthy lifestyle decisions in hopes of preventing cognitive decline. And, uh, you know, we always you know want to find that magic pill, that magic drug that's going to prevent cognitive uh, impairment uh, and give us our life to our last day on earth, um, you know, cognitive decline robs us of our life. And so we're always looking for that magic pill. And so I, um, I'm just thrilled though, that some, finally the attention of the public is going to what we can do to make healthier lifestyle, no pills involved, lifestyle decisions uh, to hopefully protect brain health as we get older. Um, so this is just a real uh, important article for me because it told me that uh, the, the public is ready to listen. And therefore, if the public is ready to listen, maybe the public is ready to get involved uh, and, and, and work together to make a difference. So what was highlighted in this particular centerfold of the Wall Street Journal was uh, the importance of blood pressure control. Um, you know, some of us had blood, high blood pressure, but uh, the important part is being active, proactive about making sure that you do everything you can with your medical professionals to keep your blood pressure under control. That we, another, uh, and the other types of activities that we can do that were talked about in this article is that we can uh, exercise and lack of exercise actually increases your risk. It's important to be cognitively stimulated in what you do on a regular basis, that's important. You've got to exercise the brain uh, as well as the body. Uh, what you eat makes a difference uh, in how you age. I didn't know, wondering if that's news to anybody, but what you eat uh, most definitely affects um, your, uh, how you pass through time um, as you get older, how you sleep, are you getting enough sleep? Um, and then some combination of all of these. So this article listed out all these different um, uh, characteristics of a person's everyday life and how when they that that if we can improve these or work to improve these even just a little bit it could make a difference in protecting brain health over time so i always like to push this uh, out because the i don't know if anyone's ever heard of the lancet commission on dementia prevention intervention and care but it's a it's a guiding force uh, in our field to come up with very uh, thorough recommendations about our new directions in science and clinical care. And the Lancet Commission in 2020, uh, their, their, uh, through an extensive review, their conclusion was that up to 35% of dementia cases, I'm gonna repeat that because that's, that's a very large number, there, up to 35% of dementia cases could be prevented by tackling risk factors. And I actually think there's an update to this and now they're up, it's up to 40%. So up to 40% is the new improved number of dementia cases can be prevented by tackling these risk factors. Now folks, that's huge. This is huge. And then uh, the other statement by the consensus was that we've got some trials in the field that are ongoing that will help us uh, know uh, what what is it what what is it in terms of lifestyle that could protect against cognitive decline. So this is a really big uh, moment in time for us. Uh, I just have to say before we go forward that. Uh, I've been doing this kind of work for mm, 30 years almost, um, and in the beginning when I started, there was very little funding for this kind of work. 
If it didn't involve a medication, you had very little chance of getting funded uh, by, by the Alzheimer's Association or the, the government, National Institutes on Health. So we've, that, that we have turned a corner. And so now we're getting a lot more results to show uh, the, the benefits, the potential benefits of lifestyle on, on memory and thinking abilities. All right, so um, I, I like this slide. It's a little simplistic, but I do like it because it kind of reminds us of uh, our lives. Um, I, I see myself there in the blue um, more often than I'd like. I, actually, um, I, I also find myself uh, in, in the potato position as well uh, from time to time. And who doesn't love a, a good burger? Um, so, uh, you know, the, and any of this for short periods of time is fine. But our bodies were uh, designed to move. Uh, and when we are not moving and we are not feeding it exactly what it needs, not in surplus, uh, we are we can expect problems. So the lifestyle um, and risk uh, that could contribute to cognitive decline, this is what we know from science, that people who are more sedentary have a higher risk. And I imagine you've heard smoking, uh, uh, sitting is the new smoking. Take that one to heart. Sitting is the new smoking. I have to think about that every day. I'm very guilty. Um, uh, a risk uh, is increased with poor diet, uh, social isolation. People who are lonely um, and alone are at higher risk for cognitive decline. So I have to say during the COVID uh, you know, pandemic where we were all socially distancing from one another, some more than others, especially our older adults, I, um, you know, we've, we're getting some estimates that cognitive uh, impairments did uh, decline at a faster rate during that time. So the translation would be that we aged extra fast um, during the pandemic due to social isolation. So, and other things, but social isolation definitely had a role. And then when we are not uh, stimulated, uh, if we are entirely passive in our the way we approach the world um, and not challenged on a regular basis, uh, we know that risk can be increased as well. So if we have chronic exposure to these kinds of behaviors, it does impact our bodies um, in, in ways that we see clearly uh, across the U.S., um, I'm always struck with this in um, airports uh, when I travel, uh, just that we, we it feels like uh, whenever I'm in these airports, I, I am reminded we've got some work to do um, with our American people to get us thinking and believing that we can make some healthy choices. It has chronic effects on the body's um, metrics for health, including blood pressure, heart, you know, the heart health, the vessel health. Um, and in the long run, um, because of these changes uh, in health and others, uh, it can have uh, significant negative consequences for brain health. And, you know, I, you, you all in this room are all uh, highly, you know, educated and well-informed. And so, you know, this should seem like, you know, of course, you'd be surprised how many people when I'm out in the communities, how many people when I bring up this connection, they look at me like, really? You're kidding? You mean what I do with my, how I take care of my body impacts my risk or my, my brain health? Uh, and, and, you know, it's always, I have to remind folks that the bottom of the body is connected to the top of the body and there is no uh, by a neck. And, and, and it really is a, you can't separate those two things. And so uh, I think, that, you know, we think we take this for granted, but I'm telling you in, in our communities that we are all working with our communities, you know, there's a lot of, um, um, people just don't realize this and, uh, and therefore are not motivated um, uh, uh, to, to make some, you know, even just small changes. All right, so this is how things have changed. Uh, and I, this is only since, you know, this is just a, a snapshot of uh, 50 years uh, from 1960 to 2010. And we're looking at our change in occupational physical activity. Um, and you can see that we, we were much more active in the 60s uh, and we are much less active uh, now. And that's has, that's has consequences uh, for what we're seeing in terms of in, in our medical centers and also in, um, in, in terms of the, the risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. And it's not just our occupational activity, uh, it's how we spend our leisure time as well. Uh, we've made changes. We used to be, you know, and that was we used. To, you know, I was uh, way back when, you know, let's just say 50s, 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, maybe even 70s. We were we were much more active. Uh, we were outside, moving around, in our leisure activity. And now, um, you know, we, we are much more sedentary and choose sedentary activities uh, to relax. It has its consequences. 
So here's what we know. Uh, the exercise uh, has, uh, I'm gonna start over here on the left. It, we know that it reduces stress and it improves a person. Regular exercise can reduce stress and improve mood. It has benefits. I'm gonna assume you can see my cursor here. It has benefits for the heart and, and benefits for the vessel. It, it reduces the bad kind of cholesterol, improves the good kind of cholesterol. It reduces the risk of type two diabetes and obesity. And, and now we are learning in the last 20 years that exercise also has benefits for the brain, not only in brain health and having the brain perform better in general, um, more resistant to uh, disease, uh, but that disease also includes Alzheimer's disease. So this kind of exercise, we're learning that it may increase your resilience uh, to Alzheimer's. All right, so this is a lot of, it's a busy slide, but I just, and you don't need to read all this. It was just more for impact on the, on the you know, the, the magnitude of the number of listings here. What I'm showing you here is all the ways that ex, we know from science uh, that exercise has benefits on the brain. And I'm listing all the different uh, investigators, scientists who have worked in this air in these areas in the blue. So let's just look at a couple of those. So exercise, we know from science that it improves the repair of cells in the brain. It re reduces oxidative stress. We do not want you don't want high levels of oxidative stress in, in the brain. It's toxic uh, for brain cells. It improves glucose metabolism, how well we metabolize our food. Uh, it uh, reduces inflama brain inflammation in particular, exercise does, regular exercise. And it also clears out the pathology, pathological uh, cell types uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this is uh, many for me, many reasons here uh, that we should be uh, as scientists uh, uh, studying exercise, but on a personal level, it's many reasons for me uh, to not only exercise for myself, but to um, work with my community members to help them figure out how to work it into their lives. All right, so real quick, what we know, I mean, I'm just gonna give you a little, little tiny history to see, to help you understand why we look at this in people right now and why we're so excited about it. So we learned uh, long ago, this is way back in the early 2000s and it even goes earlier into the 1990s. We, there was a group of people studying, you know, what, what does exercise do in rodents? And this is kind of where we start. Um, we, we wanna make sure it's gonna help uh, these uh, animals um, and it helps us understand uh, what we might expect in humans. So what we've learned with regular exercise in rodents, uh, they have uh, new, uh, new cell growth in the part of the brain that's responsible for forming new memories. Uh, the, the, tissue, uh, the, the, the tissue around the blood vessels uh, is improved. The blood flow improves. It slows brain shrinkage. It increases certain hormone levels that are critical for the development of new uh, connections between the nerve cells, and it improves memory uh, abilities uh, in rodents. So, this is you know this was uh, first when it was first reported. Everybody, uh, the you know this, the community in response to this, uh, really we were we were uh, we were surprised that exercise only can have all these benefits, and so it really did inspire a lot of new work uh, in human beings. So the next phase of humans, we, we do observational studies where we don't intervene, but we compare people who exercise versus those who don't. Um, and what we've learned is those who exercise versus those who don't, they are different kinds of people. People who exercise tend to have higher cognitive function, memory and thinking abilities. They have a reduced risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, those who exercise have uh, larger brain volumes in general. They have uh, their Alzheimer's disease uh, biomarkers, uh, so in blood and cerebrospinal fluid, suggest less risk for Alzheimer's disease. They have more favorable gene expression and genetic risk. And so, you know, this is great news, but you always have to, you know, in our, in this, particularly in this group here, is always well aware that, um, you know, observational studies are, um, they, there's problems with observational studies. There's a lot of things that are different about people that have nothing to do with their lifestyle. It, a lot of things that, you know, it has to do with your early exposures, what your, you know, your access to healthcare, 
your what what you know what what kind of environment you lived in. So it's really important to have clinical trials. Um, and so we've learned uh, in in probably in the last I'd say ten years, fifteen years, we've uh, human randomized controlled trials, the RCTs, have been uh, ongoing. But thanks to this new funding that I've mentioned uh, with by the Alzheimer's Association and the National Institutes on Health. And we've uh, learned uh, in the in the last in this time that uh, we have preliminary evidence now to suggest that when you assign people to one or the other, and we try to then therefore uh, level the playing field with regard to what happened to them in the past, what their exposures were as children or younger adults, we're still seeing positive effects on cognition, brain structure, and function, and on those Alzheimer's uh, biomarkers. So I want to show you one, uh, and I'll try to explain this simply uh, because I, um, uh, I I just think it's a, a simple finding that I it really inspires me on a regular basis. So what I'm going to show you here is the results of one particular study that really um, got everybody really excited about the the idea that exercise could have beneficial effects on the brain in older adults in particular. So the, the, this study is showing the plus plus just means positive, the positive exercise effects on brain in cognitively normal older adults. And so what I'm gonna, in this study, there were about 150 individuals. Uh, they completed uh, exercise for six months. Um, they were uh, under the, uh, they had some supervision. So they had some, some help there. Um, and they were uh, randomized into one of two groups, either in a higher intensity aerobic group or a stretching balance range of motion group. So low intensity and high intensity. And what I'm showing you here is that this is the brain. This is just kind of an image of the brain. And this is the three different viewpoints of the brain. So this is from the underside looking up as if you are laying down on someone at someone's feet looking up. This is the top side looking down bird's eye view. And this is the side view looking at the half looking up. And what you're seeing the colored areas are showing areas where they saw in this study of 150 people uh, evidence of brain uh, volume increases, increases. So the blue areas is the gray matter or the brain, the, the, the uh, neurons themselves, and the orange or yeah, yeah, areas are the white matter or the myelinated areas that connect uh, one area of the brain to another. So we've got increased brain volume in uh, uh, 150 older adults following six months of aerobic exercise. And this is compared to people in the stretching and balance. So they basically subtracted. So what we see here is the difference. So these are these colors are the, the benefit due to exercise relative to stretching balance range of motion. So this is kind of uh, got everybody excited that we can have a non-pharmacologic trial, uh, no, no drugs on board, and we could actually show objective changes in brain uh, due to exercise alone for older adults. And this is really a key because it's the, you know, the older adults are those that we are uh, in our group uh, that we, and my scientific colleagues, and, and uh, we are, it's the older adults that we, we really want to study. These are the one, these are the adults that are at highest risk for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Let me go back. And so we've also, since that time, we've, uh, uh, we've also found some other positive cognitive response to exercise in these randomized controlled trials for adults with lower cognitive scores only. Not also, not just the cognitively normal folks, but folks with cognitive impairment also. But they were, these uh, previous studies are, you know, they're, they're, they're preliminary, uh, they're, they're smaller, um, and we really uh, needed to uh, test to see if this was going to uh, pan out in, a, in other studies as well. So I wanted to show you something that we did in one of our studies, and um, this is a study that we I started in Seattle and I finished it in North Carolina when I moved called the PACE study. And in this study, it was a, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, repeat what the uh, previous study had found, um, that the previous study had found that there's a positive benefit for, there's a benefit in brain function for cognitively normal adult, older adults, but no one had really looked at people with mild cognitive impairment. And so um, I'm assuming most folks in this group know what mild cognitive impairment is, but in case you don't, um, this is the, this is, I always call it the gray zone between cognitively normal. Uh, so the cognitively normal older adults, they're having changes, but they're normal for age. 
Um, and then uh, when you when a person uh, is starting to show early symptoms of short-term memory loss, uh, very mild though, very mild short-term memory loss and difficulties with planning, organization, uh, paying attention, um, then we, this person has moved into this mild cognitive impairment gray zone. Uh, as this mild cognitive impairment gray zone continues to progress, these are the folks who uh, go on to develop dementia. Uh, so these people with mild cognitive impairment are at high risk uh, for developing dementia um, within a, a fairly short period of time uh, within the scope of a lifetime. So in this study, I wanted to kind of see if exercise could be medicine for people with mild cognitive impairment using the same uh, exercise uh, design uh, that the previous folks had used, um, uh, the, the, where I showed you the brain pictures a moment ago. That, that group was out of Champaign, uh, Illinois, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, so I'll just call that the University of Illinois study. So we wanted to repeat that, see if we can get the same findings in people who are at high risk of dementia, which for me would have very it would be very important to uh, identify an intervention that could help these individuals. So what we did is we had a six month study, just like the previous one. We had a, a, people were assigned to either aerobic training or stretching control. Uh, so one of two groups, uh, we had about 70 people, 71 people in this study. We, they went through extensive clinical evaluations to make sure that these people really did have mild cognitive impairment. They really were not normal uh, in terms of their memory. If they had dementia, uh, more in, significant impairment, they were not allowed to go into this study. And so we had lots of different measurements. We looked at their glucose, their, their glucose metabolism, their walk test, we collected blood, we had lumbar puncture, we had brain uh, imaging of the, of the brain, cognition, and so forth. So we, we really wanted to, to study this well. So I'm just going to show you a couple of findings that we got. Um, so here's our cognitive. We cognition was always a primary that we're looking for because, you know, the whole goal is to see if exercise might be medicine to protect cognitive uh, function. So the type, types of tests we always focus on in exercise trials are those that are affected by aging uh, and those that are affected by uh, the progression of, uh, from, from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease. So those kinds of cognition, cognitive tasks include uh, the short-term memory tasks. So list learning, uh, remembering uh, stories, um, remembering what you see and hear. Uh, for short over short periods of time and then testing to see how well it uh, sticks with the individual so what's your longer term uh, memory and that that's something that we see does change with normal aging uh, but at a much faster rate for people who have uh, are at high risk for developing dementia and then this also this executive function which is one of my personal favorites uh, because i feel like uh, executive function is um is something that's uh, very vulnerable uh, to aging and it's very vulnerable to the the onset and progression of mild cognitive impairment. So executive function is your CEO of your um, cognition. Uh, your executive function abilities allow you to plan, organize, prioritize, problem solve, uh, arrange your day, uh, identify what's more important than another, stop doing what you're doing so that you can do something else and then return to what you were doing when you when it's time to do that. This is that this is that part of the brain. And what we see in executive function is that in the early stages of um, mild cognitive impairment, it's these executive function tasks that are uh, most noticeably no, most noticeably declining. And so a lot of times when people go to the clinic, they go see their doctor and they'll say, you know, uh, I'm having some memory problems. Doc will do a test. Um, uh, oftentimes, it, I mean, depending on what kind, if it's not a specialist, um, a, a doc, a, you know, the standard test that's administered these days is something called a mini mental status exam, or now it's the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the MOCA. But there are short screening exams that can be done in a clinic. But oftentimes people will, um, uh, will, will be able to use strategies that they have to help them with their memory. So they'll be repeating it or they might, um, they have, you know, they'll use mnemonics or, but so they can cover a memory impairment through using strategies. You can, you can hide it in the early stages. In the late stages, you can't. Executive function, you can't hide this. Uh, 
this is these are um, these are uh, tasks that are very diff di uh, difficult to uh, compensate for um, in a clinical exam. So we really uh, it's really important to uh, that we you know pay attention to those and we measure those as in the earliest stages of, of, of mild cognitive impairment. So this is what we found over on the right. We uh, put our, we are primarily interested in executive function. We the the Champagne Urbana group uh, only saw executive function changes as a result of exercise, um, and there's a reason for that. Um, but we saw, and I'll tell you in just a moment. But we so that's where I, we all all of our attention was on the executive function, and what we found is with the aerobic group, their executive function abilities improved. With our control group, our stretching and balance group. Uh, their executive function declined. And so you might ask, was stretching make executive function worse? And our answer is no, because what re remember that these people all have mild cognitive impairment. And by definition, uh, when you are in this gray zone and you have mild cognitive impairment of, and, and we chose specifically, we included people who are at greatest risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So it's a specific type of mild cognitive impairment. By definition, since they are at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, they will decline over time. And so when we see a decline here, uh, this is what we would expect uh, for these individuals uh, over a six month period. Uh, so, and then just gonna show you real quickly what we saw when we did the brain imaging. Um, we looked at a uh, whole brain cerebral blood flow, so uh, across all, all vessels in the brain. And then the people with the aerobic group, their vessel uh, blood flow increased. In the stretching group, it was no difference, no different. And then we looked at the regional specific areas of cerebral blood flow, and all the colored areas are areas where we saw increased flow for the aerobic group. So what's uh, interesting to me is the red areas are areas uh, in the frontal part of the brain that normally show decreased flow, blood flow with advancing age. This is typical. All, most of us show decreased blood flow in these red areas. We saw increased blood flow with aerobic exercise. The blue areas are areas where we typically see decreased blood flows, blood flow with advancing mild cognitive impairment towards dementia. And so here we have an intervention with aerobic exercise that increased the flow in these particular areas. So for me, this is hopeful. It's still, you know, this is based on 35 people. So, you know, in the concept, of, in, in, in the context of the rest of the United States, this is, you know, just a, this is just, you know, um, a micro droplet uh, in a cup of water. It's, we need to really do a much better job of including way more people than this. This is not enough to generalize, but it does inspire further investigation. That's the purpose here. So the further investigation is this one. And my, my partner who's gonna speak after me was a, was a part of this study uh, and really a critical, was critical in helping us design and carry out this study. So I'm really glad that he's here and uh, Mr. Tim is here to talk to us. So in this next study, which was inspired uh, by our earlier work, uh, we call this excerpt. Um, and it was a national clinical trial uh, involving 14 different cities. I actually know because New York, um, that's where I am right now. Um, New York had two centers here. So it's really 13 cities, 14 sites. It was 300 older adults, all with mild cognitive impairment of the type that's at higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So they, that's, it's, it's the Alzheimer's type of mild cognitive impairment. Our goal was to test whether regular exercise can protect against cognitive decline in adults who are at high risk uh, for decline. All right, so this is what our study looked like. I told you before that you know last studies were all six months, and we knew that we you know that's not that's the, that's a that's what we call a beta test. We need to really expand that and go much longer. And so in this study, it was a uh, twelve months uh, with supervision. And uh, so participants were randomized to either the aerobic or a stretching balance uh, group. And then they all, and it was two, they had to exercise, uh, the aerobic group had to, uh, both groups had to exercise four times a week, 30 to 40 minutes each time. The one group was randomized to the aerobic group. And that means we were asking them to get their heart rate up, heart rate reserve. Uh, so this takes into consideration your resting heart rate. But you can just think about it at about 70 to 80 percent of your maximum, whereas the stretching balance group also four times a week, 
they, but they had to maintain their heart rate at a lower uh, speed. So this is uh, this was a really critical partnership that we had with the YMCA. The YMCA had uh, their trainers uh, that were all uh, extra trained uh, to learn what it's like to live with mild cognitive impairment. All of them went through training to understand what life was like for these people so that they could relate to them a little bit better and develop some more genuine relationships. Um, and so we partnered with the YMCA. All of our people went to the YMCA and exercised. So they asked to go to the YMCA four times a week. And all of our folks were sedentary to begin with. So really, um, for, you, for you guys out there who work with people, uh, get them to exercise, uh, you know that if you've worked with sedentary individuals, we had, our, we had our work cut out for us. And that's why we would never have gone with anyone else except for the YMCA. Uh, we're very grateful. They have the training, the expertise, the way they connect to the participants, the way, the way that they motivate. Um, this was really an important partnership. And it's because of the why that our folks stayed in the study. Um, we got so much feedback from them. Um, and I'll, uh, so uh, just before I tell you this, I just have to say that this study was completed during the pandemic. Um, which was so hard. Um, the YMCA's were having their own issues. Um, a lot of people were losing their jobs and the YMCA's were closed. And our participants would contact us on a regular basis and asking, worried about the trainers, Might wanted to make sure that they were still around. Could they help donate for their salaries? Um, we, we got so many reports. It was just a testament to the, the impact of the YMCA in these people's lives. That they really made a difference. I think we even, we've been finished with the study now since uh, November of last year. Wow year. Wow. A year ago. And um, our, our participants and some of our trainers are still in contact with one another. So um, I, I just really hats off to, to the YMCA. Um, our primary outcome was, a, again, a, it was a global measure of cognitive function, uh, not just executive function, but we really care about you know, if it just affects cognitive executive function, great. But this is supposed to be, you know, the definitive study, uh, the ends, the last one that we need to do to, you know, to really show that exercise can be medicine. So we care about the whole picture uh, of cognition. Is it going to help these people get through their day, uh, their daily life? So that's why we use decided to use a global measure that included both short term memory and executive function together. So this is what uh, thrills me to no end. Because of the YMCA, um, we had uh, over, uh, we had our adherence was uh, to the intervention, following the three to four times a week for 30, 40 minutes, 74% in people with, my, with challenges they have to deal with every single day. Again, a testament to the why. And our retention in the study was 85%, even during COVID. Um, and as a group, our 300 people uh, together completed over 31,000 exercise sessions in the 12 months only, which is the, that's our main endpoint because that's when we were, under, it was mostly control, it was more controlled because it was supervised. Uh, participants had two times a week supervision and they had to uh, exercise on their own two times a week. Um, and that, that was just really more to test whether this was doable. You know, if we get positive results, can we send them out in the world um, to and, and only give them supervision half the time? At the end of the 12 months in our study, they transitioned or graduated into all unsupervised exercise. And I'm not going to tell you about that yet because we are still looking at those data. I'm just going to tell you about what happened in that first 12 months. Um, and I, I'm not going to show you graphs this time because we're we're still uh, we're still uh, in the process of writing this up. But I uh, it, as a as a manuscript and getting it published. But we presented these uh, findings at our recent Alzheimer's Association International Conference in San Diego, and it really uh, it received a lot of press. And here is an example. Um, of some of the press that it received. If if you want to see more about what you know what people were saying about it, you can just Google excerpt um, and uh, excerpt exercise Alzheimer's or excerpt exercise uh, or and my name Baker Baker, and you'll see a whole. It, it really did get a lot of attention. I think it's because people really want to hear about the possible benefits of exercise for brain health. What we found was that regular regular. That means, remember, we're asking people three to four times a week. So regular is a key, I should underline this one also, regular supported. Uh, the YMCA was right by the side of our participants. So regular supported high or low intensity exercise for 125, 20 to 150 minutes per week for 12 months, slowed cognitive decline. 
in sedentary older adults with MCI. Okay, let me just qualify that just for a minute. With people, in people with mild cognitive impairment, we've already talked about this a moment ago, we expect change over time. We expect in a year's time, we know from other studies, and we actually did do a head-to-head -head comparison of excerpt to other studies, we know from other studies that the people with mild cognitive impairment will have a significant decline in their global cognitive function in 12 months. It is, it is a known fact. So what we found then, which is exciting to me, is that any exercise, remember we completed 31,000, so it's not that we weren't doing it. Uh, we, were, we completed 31,000 sessions. Any supported exercise uh, for this amount of time, this 150 minutes a week for 12 months uh, for sedentary older adults was enough to stall decline. They should have gotten worse. And in our study, they stayed exactly where they were when they started the study. No decline. We're not seeing benefit, but we never expected benefit. With, with people in a, who have a neurodegenerative disease, we don't expect benefit. Our goal is to protect against decline. And that's exactly what we saw. Um, it was, uh, I think the other notable point is that excerpt was conducted during a pandemic. And, you know, a lot of you can think, well, that, wow, that must have been really, you know, that must have been a real, uh, must have hurt the study. And I have to think about it. I think about it the, actually the other way, that we went through this and kept our people in the study exercising through a pandemic. We would call, during the pandemic, we were calling them every week and they were reporting on the phone that they were continuing with their excerpt exercise at home with walking, the stretching, uh, they were going out with families to make sure that they were completing it, even for the three months that they were not coming into the YMCA or to the clinic. So that's, a, again, a testament, I think, to uh, the, their the participants for sure. Um, but when, when we go through a pandemic like this, and therefore that is a real life example of you know, a tragic uh, life event, well, these people with mild cognitive impairment have impairments have tragic life events all the time because of the mild cognitive impairment. Life is difficult for these individuals. Life gets in the way. They have difficult, they get from point A to point B like all of us, but the pathway, the, what they have to go through to get from point A to point B during a single day is much more difficult for them. So they have more life challenges than the rest of us. So the pandemic showed us that if we can still find no decline in, in cognition for these people who should have declined, even during a pandemic, that means what we found might actually generalize to real life, um, the real life challenges that these individuals have on a regular basis because of this condition. All right, so you're probably sitting think, there thinking, well, what's the difference? Why, why are we getting, uh, why, why did we get results? Why do we get no decline for either group now, low or high intensity? Whereas before, when I first started, I talked to you about that the aerobic group seemed to be the better group in terms of cognitive protection. Well, there's a couple of key important differences. Number one, the excerpt study was longer. 12 months versus the other studies, both the Champaign-Urbana and my previous PACE study was only six months. And a lot of the early studies were only six months. They're beta test, proof of concept. Well, excerpt was supposed to be more the definitive trial. We had to go longer, 12 months. So think about this. If the total volume of exercise is allowed to uh, accumulate beyond six months, uh, and so we have double the volume by 12 months, we might expect very different findings. And if we're talking about a low intensity exercise, uh, doubling that volume may get it up to the same benefit as a smaller amount of time of higher intensity, if that makes sense. So more volume. Uh, in excerpt, participants were supervised, they got support twice a week rather than once a week. In our PACE studies and the Champaign-Urbana, the participants got uh, support once a week, and then they had to exercise on their own three times a week. I believe uh, we're looking at that. We're looking into this more closely now that it's the support that people perceived, that regular side-by-side uh, -side encouraging support, accountability is key for the success of the intervention. 
And I don't think it's the support only. Um, I think it's the, because of our, we have some other work that shows people who exercise alone do benefit, but you have add support. And you, I, I, I think that is a, one of the magic, magic ingredients of, of our success here is that exercise plus support and regular, regular too. And this was a much larger trial. Remember the the, the imaging study I just uh, the results I just showed you based on 35 people. The Champagne Urbana was based on 150, so this is double the numbers. Um, and my PACE study was based on 70. So larger often means uh, you're going to get more stable or and more generalizable results. All right, so um, I, I think I'm just watching my time here. I know I need to move along. I just wanted to kind of uh, let you see what else is going on in the field and how we're going to take this forward. Oh, yes, we're interested in exercise. We will continue that work. We have excerpt, we're going to do excerpt two, Tim. Somehow we're going to do excerpt two. I uh, don't know what it's going to look like, uh, but it's really more community, uh, you know, more rolling this out into the community. But, um, and, you know, there are other studies that are starting to look at combinations. And I mentioned this at the very beginning with the Wall Street Journal, that a combination of healthy lifestyle could have an even bigger impact. It may increase the overall dose because you combine exercise plus sleep plus diet. The effects might be synergistic. So one plus one might not equal two. Um, exercise, if you're exercising and eating a healthier diet, you may benefit more than either alone uh, or in combination. I mean, either alone. Um, and it allows, having this multi-domain allows for tailoring. So not everybody can exercise. Um, not everybody is, can, you might have some restrictions on diet, but if we have a multi-domain, we can pick what, meet a person where they are and identify where we can get started, uh, even with small steps. So I just wanted to show you this as an example of a, a multi-domain study that went on in, in Finland, uh, all different kinds of activities with group interactions and some exercise and stretching, watching their weight um, ex, uh, in, in more aerobic-like activity. They found this is, if you've ever, uh, this is called the finger trial. You can always just Google finger trial and you can always read more about it. But what they found is when they compared people who were there was 1,200, uh, 1,260 people aged 60 to 77. They were testing whether lifestyle could protect brain health. And so folks were randomized either to a multi-domain intervention or regular health advice. And the multi-domain included some nutritional counseling, some exercise encouragement, some cognitive training, some mental exercises, and some vascular risk monitoring, watching your blood pressure, your blood sugar, getting regular checkups, and so forth. Um, what they found is that this multi-domain intervention improved cognition. It uh, had these people had fewer chronic illnesses, and they had less uh, decline in their functional status. They're able to stay independent for longer periods of time. So what happened uh, as a result of finger is this kind of life multi-domain lifestyle intervention study exploded worldwide. Many countries now started saying it you know, wanted to take this on for themselves. I mean, what the nice thing, the nice part about a lifestyle intervention is, you know, a lot of countries don't have access to the expensive medications or the healthcare facilities to be able to distribute these. And so a lifestyle intervention is very appealing uh, to many multi in a multicultural sense. And so uh, the, the, um, Darker blue studies are all the countries, uh, country, uh, darker blue countries are all the ones that are, have currently lifestyle intervention, multi-domain lifestyle interventions currently in progress. And this is actually an old map because the, the ones with the light blue, we say we're planning, but uh, Latin American fingers is almost finished uh, with enrollment. So we have a lot of, we have over 40 countries now all doing similar lifestyle interventions. And we meet together as a group, we share our experiences and we will share our data. Um, our goal is that if we can all do this as a globe in a global community, we will identify ways to meet everyone where they are um, and, and be sensitive and responsive to different cultures. Um, and so this is really, this. if it's going to work, we need to have a cultural sensitivity and responsiveness that needs to be included in the, in the lifestyle intervention. Okay. And I, I just said that. So 
Um, and here we've got one going on here uh, in U.S. in uh, the United States. Uh, we are referred to as U.S. Pointer, and uh, our people are about. We've got about two thousand people that are all cognitively normal. Um, this age, same age as the finger study, and they're all at increased risk for cognitive decline. Many of them have a family history. They're all sedentary. They have an unhealthy diet, uh, meaning meaning they have the American diet. They're not already eating a healthy diet, a super healthy diet, and they might have mild uh, high blood pressure, mild, just borderline high blood sugar, that kind of thing. And our, goals is to our goal is to test whether uh, the effects of two different lifestyle interventions on cognitive function over two years. We have two different groups, uh, two different lifestyle group intervention groups. One is a self-guided where the participants can design their own lifestyle program. Everybody receives education on healthy lifestyles and brain imaging, uh, health, brain health, and then we do annual monitoring. The structured group has to follow a program. So we're kind of testing to see which one is going to be better uptake by the community, which one's going to be more uh, likely to be followed, and how well, uh, what's the, what's the, um, how, how the community is receiving this. But also we're testing to see if there's a difference in cognitive benefit as well. As of today, we've got 1,800 people of our 2,000 are enrolled. Um, and so uh, let's see, this is not going on in, um, in, Mar in um, uh, Maryland, but you've, we've got uh, your nearest site is in uh, New England, uh, Rhode Island. Um, and the other sites are in Houston and Chicago and North Carolina and California, Northern California. Uh, but we really hope that the results of this study will help us know how much is enough, what do we have to do to make some lifestyle changes, and can it truly protect against uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease among people who are at high risk of developing uh, dementia. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple of pictures of the different um, uh, st studies across the globe who are doing um, some of these lifestyle interventions. And what's what's cool is that every country is doing their own thing. They're, they're meeting people where they are. So in China, for example, uh, it's involving rural areas in China. There's group activities in local parks for the exercise. The cognitive stimulation of getting people in, in um, and this is in Thailand, uh, to, in, to gather to play games on a regular basis. Um, in other countries, this is Australia, they're changing the, uh, adding new di uh, recipes to the uh, typical Australian diet to include uh, a healthy, more colorful uh, uh, plate. And so it's just, I'm just so excited to be part of this worldwide fingers network where we're going to learn so much about different cultures and different people and how to roll out uh, lifestyle um, interventions for everybody, um, regardless of access to healthcare um, and what, what, uh, and their, um, their younger life exposures. All right. So to finish up here, uh, we learn, hopefully you feel uh, uh, that we are, I've convinced you that we do have some building evidence to, to show beneficial effects of uh, physical exercise on brain health. Um, and the recent results of excerpt show that it can protect cognition over 12 months and people are at high risk for Alzheimer's disease. This is really, really important uh, for me. We do not have a treatment. Or we have one treatment uh, that was just approved uh, not too long ago, but it is, um, you know, it's a pharmacologic treatment that, uh, that is ex not going to be accessible for all people. And we also um, know that other aspects of lifestyle may contribute to how the mind ages. Um, we've talked about some of those. And then we, we do know that we have these other long, large uh, efforts supported by our government and the Alzheimer's Association that will help us. Um, they will provide definitive information about whether lifestyle, such as exercise, diet, cognitive stimulation and challenge, um, and, and knowing your numbers, uh, monitoring your health, can truly uh, be medicine uh, to protect cognition and protect against decline. So here's all my peeps. Uh, we have a lot of people who are really uh, devoted and dedicated um, like Tim here. Uh, these are people who believe in lifestyle and believe that it can make a difference um, and want to help create a movement uh, in our communities to get people, meet people where they are and make small changes. So, um, Corinne and, uh, and others, I, I think I'll stop here. Um, not sure if we want to do questions now or, or wait till later. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, that was very, very fascinating and interesting. And um, I just want to reiterate that we will have the opportunity for 
more uh, question and answers also at the end. And before I go and introduce uh, Timothy Gribble, I neglected earlier to mention um, the organizers of this event here. And it is a collaborative uh, engagement of various different parts of Morgan State University. Uh, the RCMI Center you heard about at the beginning, the um, Ascent Center, and very prominently Morgan Cares, which is a um, subsidiary of the RCMI program. And we are doing this in collaboration with the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and the Johns Hopkins Disease Resource Center for Minority Aging and Research and the Greater Maryland Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. So thank you all for these partners to come together. And now I'm going to introduce Timothy Gerbel. Um, thank you for being here, Mr. Gerbel. And uh, Mr. Gerbel manages a suit of evidence-based health initiatives that serve to prevent or manage chronic diseases such as obesity, hypertension, cancer, diabetes, as well as fall risk in older adults. Through the YMCA and in partnership with community and other national organizations, Mr. Gribble has worked in research over the past 10 years in roles ranging from interventionist to project manager. We heard he was um, collaborating with um, Dr. Baker. Some of the most notable trials include parent and child diabetes prevention, Alzheimer's disease prevention trials, and trials focused on increasing mobility in older adults. Welcome, Timothy Gribble, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my screen if I get this right. All right. All right. Give me one moment. All right. Can everybody see it? All right. Good. Um, so yeah, I appreciate the introduction. I um, so and, and Laura, that was that was an excellent presentation. Uh, always uh, a pleasure to, to be able to hear from you. And um, the excerpt too was exciting to hear. That was a uh, that's breaking news. Should be flashing across the screen. Um, I wasn't aware of that. So uh, my side is is and what I was invited to kind of give you all is is the uh, more of the boots on the ground kind of. From, my experience in helping with the uh, implementation of, of some of the things that you know Dr. Baker talked about, uh, in addition to just kind of some of my experiences, just in working with the YMCA. Um, I heard earlier um, it had a nice ring to it, but uh, I heard Dr. Gribble. And um, but in fairness, I've, I've seen I've seen about every episode of House MD, but that's about as close as I've come to Dr. Gribble. So I just want full disclaimer uh, up front there. But I'm excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity just to kind of share a little bit about. Again, my experience and, and what we do at the YMCA, um, the lens I'm kind of talking through today, um, just so you're aware, is you know it's more around um, again what I've observed um, and kind of just really um, I've had the privilege over the last ten years, as as mentioned in the introduction, just really to be able to come to work every day and and the sole purpose um, really just to love on people, to invest into people. Um, and, and I absolutely love my job and what I get to do every day. Um, and I love the excerpt trial and um, uh, it was a wonderful partnership. And uh, I, I look forward at the opportunity potentially to be uh, involved in, in a second rendition of that. <laughs> um, so hopefully, you know, what you'll find today, you know, maybe you'll take some motivation for yourself. Um, uh, if you're already very active, um, if not, uh, maybe, uh, or if you are very active, maybe you can take you know some of the tools that you pick up today, and maybe use those to um, maybe help get a loved one uh, moving. Um, so just to, to revisit a little bit of uh, excerpt and uh, my my time with them, so ended up being uh, six years that uh, we got to spend um, partially because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, it was a, a fantastic experience. Uh, I got to serve again as both the trainer and a project manager. Um, and you know, over that time, uh, there was a, obviously 
many and many conversations as, as Laura mentioned, uh, you know, we got to meet four times a week or at least twice a week rather um, for 45 minutes at a time. And, and you know, that's, that's a good amount of time to spend with someone uh, on a consistent basis. Um, but one of the things and some of the things that I recognized uh, early on and throughout was, um, you know, the participants in this trial and, and Laura, you know, again, alluded to this, Dr. Baker alluded to this, but um, um, once they committed, they were with it, you know, unless, you know, life circumstances or occurrences pulled them away, you know, um, I could count on them to be there. Um, our attrition was super low. Uh, adherence was, you know, really, really high. Um, uh, just overall, it was, uh, you know, really, it was interesting to see and to see um, those folks. And that's been kind of a similar trend too. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention it later in the presentation, but some of the other programs or trials that we've included, especially with older adults, um, to see kind of that, that commitment factor of when they, you know, when they, um, when they do commit to something, uh, they, they absolutely do see it through. Um, so it's really, really cool. Um, I guess the other piece would be uh, just the, excuse me. Oh, let me move down. Um, the the opportunity for them to be able to just to share. I think that was a, another uh, major piece. Um, I think a lot of them just kind of rub with the opportunity to be able to to come in and just share about their life experience. Um, again, this is partially, I think maybe because, you know, some of the stories that they had, their, their loved ones are probably tired of hearing them. So they got to tell somebody new. Um, and aside from that, you know, it was an opportunity for me to be able to, to learn a lot. You know, uh, I'm a firm believer that you get wisdom one of two ways. You experience it yourself or you learn from, you know, someone else's experience. So, so the opportunity to be able to, to kind of, to be able to hear from these folks and to hear about their life experience and to really connect on a really deep level, um, it was amazing. Um, and then, you know, uh, the just the, uh, I think the opportunity to, for them to be able to, in sharing those experiences and the opportunity to be heard, um, I think it gave them a, a sense of belonging, a sense of community. The more we would, you know, come and, and, and even during the study, we were encouraged to not just bring them in and treat it like a clinical setting because that's not what it was intended to be. It was intended to bring them in, to get them engaged, to give them other aspects of the why kind of life and the why culture, you know, introduce them to people and, and make them feel warm and welcome. And, and again, a part of, of our family, our YMCA family. Um, and I think that, I think that in turn maybe had a part on keeping that um, adherence and, and keeping the attrition a little bit lower. Um, and the other concept, again, which was a big, big piece, um, was listen first. And listen first is, is, is really a principle you know, that we live by at the YMCA. Um, it, and what it does is allows us to better understand how we can engage um, you know, with, with, with folks and ultimately be able to connect them in doing so. Um, it's really simple by design. Um, it's, it's doing the things that we, you know, we sh really probably should be doing you know, with good communication anyways. It's, it's open-ended questions. It's getting, you know, giving affirmation, so affirmative nods or, or just affirmation as they're kind of telling their story, just to let them know that you, can, you continue to be engaged with them. Eye contact, um, reflecting back to them um, that, you know, what, what they're saying to make sure that you have a clear understanding of, of again, what they're, um, what they're telling you. And then summarizing at the end um, in a similar, kind of a similar fashion. But for us, you know, that concept is, it, it's extremely foundational. Um, because what it does is, is it allows us, again, to kind of pave the way, um, you know, and gives us the ability to help them kind of on the wellness journey um, by really knowing kind of, again, what makes them tick, what they're motivated by, uh, what their goals are, uh, what they get excited about. Um, but unless you really take time to stop, slow down, uh, avoid the other distractions, you know, and, and really hone in on what someone's really saying, um, it's, it's really hard to do that. And I, I, I included this quote. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes, and it ties right into this, but it says, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. Um, and, and unfortunately, I'm guilty of that second part way too often, but over the years, I worked really hard in, in working on the first portion of that, of that quote, and, and, and the way I've done that has been able, again, to just to, it's, I think it's about having a human-to-human -human connection, um, letting them know that they're important, they're valued, that you hear them. Um, and that means it, it, it means everything to people um, to be able to do that. Um, so I, I guess I would mention too, if you exercise now uh, and you, you know, again, you've been trying to 
kind of get someone else to do the same. I mean, this is this is a really good tool um, that you know if you sometimes you got to pump the brakes and start using you know some of these listen first skills um, in you know, in your conversation around exercise. It's real easy to get uh, prescriptive, and, and because you know a lot of times we might know if if we exercise now, you know we might know what it takes and um, what they need to be doing. But sometimes, and, and we know this a lot of times, pre presentation is everything. And and um, I guess the other thing I would mention is you know, it kind of leads into the next slide of, of, it's not about the prescriptive piece, you know, it's about partnering with people. So, um, you know, we get a lot of folks that come into the YMCA uh, and again, um, we, we may know or think we know that, you know, what they need, uh, you know, but if we just describe it without getting their input, the, you know, it's not likely that they're gonna be successful, uh, as likely that they're gonna be successful, you know, so we need to, again, know, you know, maybe what they've been successful with in the past, um, barriers, um, again, what are their interests? Um, the more information that we can get, uh, the better we can help to partner with them to develop that plan um, that they're gonna actually stick with. Um, again, so it's through, it's through that listen first that we're able to do that, um, you know, again, and, and the goals piece is so important. Um, again, figuring out their interests, if it's their, their passion, it could be their grandkids, hobbies, uh, family, you know, what are their goals? Um, and then together, we work together to align them with the programs and services we have available. Um, the, you know, with regards to combating the, you know, the effects of isolation, again, that was something that already existed, at least, you know, again, in my, in my time with the YMCA and, and conversations with people as they would come in, you know, and just hearing stories, you know, from folks that, you know, I heard a story one time here that, um, you know, about a, it was an older individual that came to the Y and the first time they came, they sent their car and cried um, and they never came in that time. They left and eventually got the courage to come back and eventually they came into the door, they joined the Y, we sat down with them and we started going through this process and how do we get them plugged in. Um, but just knowing that, you know, for some people, you know, just the taking that step to be able to come in, you know, especially if they're in isolation, you know, we got to, it's, it's serious work, you know, it's a serious opportunity to be able to make an impact. Um, you know, with COVID-19, obviously that exacerbated um, the, the isolation component um, a lot. Um, you know, during that, we had to figure out ways how to still, you know, do what we could to, to try to engage and, to, and, you know, obviously during a time when the world kind of shut down. Um, some of the things that we did, um, you know, we made thousands of phone calls. Um, you know, we called them wellness checks just during the pandemic. Um, our employees, even some of our employees would, they would actually take things to, to folks that if they needed them and they had the, the ability to do so, they would take them things that they needed, um, especially if they had, you know, if they had folks that really didn't have anybody they could depend on. Um, we gave people information about resources during the pan pandemic. You know, the biggest thing, you know, is it, essentially we were just trying to kind of find out what the needs were and try to meet them. But I say that to say that, you know, again, for us and as a member organization, as a community-based organization that serves and, you know, loves on people, you know, it can be transactional and it can feel transactional. You know, again, when you come to the YMCA or, or a, a community center or somewhere that's, you know, and it doesn't feel transactional, you know, it feels relational, you know, that's, that's where you start to break down walls and that's where you start to, to have an opportunity to make an impact and a difference. Um, <clears throat> You know, another thing uh, that we did uh, from the pandemic, and I'll, I'll mention later, is uh, we embrace virtual. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about technology, and then I'll also talk about another program that we um, moved to virtual. But um, I even have my reservations about that. But um, you know, there were some growing pains, but we, you know, we made it through that. Um, actually, it wasn't too too bad. Um, and then the reality is, is some folks are still reluctant to, to come back to uh, you know a place like the YMCA. Um, and you know, again, we just have to continue to try to to meet their needs and to figure out how we can stay engaged uh, with them until they're they're at a place where they're they're comfortable to do so. Um, so just some information, some some numbers uh, with our association. So I'm um, here in the YMCA of Northwest North Carolina, uh, which is our association. It's made up of you know 14 branches or so. Um, we serve you know six, over 16,000 older adults just here in our association. You know, and that's just this Northwest North Carolina region. Um, not to include the rest of the nation or, or YMCAs around the world. Um, and, you know, again, looking at the chart, you know, you'll see that, you know, there's, um, that number is going to only increase. Um, if you look at the chart, you'll see, and again, this is from 2017, so it's got a little bit of age on it, but, you know, um, children, you know, outnumbered 
uh, adults 65 plus by you know, nearly 25 million. But we see in 2034, it's projected that older adults, you know, adults 65 plus are gonna surpass um, children. So, I mean, they're gonna catch up pretty rapidly. So, you know, we know as, as again, the, the population continues to age that, you know, our programs and services, you know, they're gonna have to follow that trend. Um, so obviously within the YMCA or, or wherever, you know, we're talking about, you know, we have to, we have to be cognizant of that and work like Dr. Pitt and what Baker's doing um, is, is even that much more important. Um, so some of the ways we engage, um, you know, and again, there's several, but I just picked a few, um, you know, some social activities, uh, pickleball, I mentioned just because uh, you guys may or may not know this, but pickleball is all the rage. Um, you know, just in the past five years, um, I was looking up sports and fitness industry association uh, said that um, they've doubled in just the past five years. They're at 5 million people playing pickleball these days, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, and especially to, to have that type of growth in, in just a shorter period of time. Um, our folks take day trips. Um, so we get them involved uh, again, you know, in, in various different ways. So one of the ways is you know, they, they'll go to the zoo, um, the county fair, uh, take trips to casino. Not sure about that one, but they do it. Holiday uh, light festivals, they go to Renaissance festivals. So there's all types of trips that they'll, they'll take together. Um, potlucks, um, I will say, uh, again, if you want to engage, connect with people, um, just involve food. Uh, if you do that, <laughs> they'll show up. Uh, but the reality is, too, that the Y family, I, I realized this many years ago, that the Y family, too, is um, it's sometimes the only family that, that some folks have. So you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, you know, um, and again, COVID's been hard, it's been hard for us to do the potlucks again, but, um, you know, Thanksgiving, you know, this might be the only Thanksgiving that they have, so, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity, and uh, for them to have some fellowship, and to uh, just, again, feel a sense of connection, and belonging, and, and, and again, community. Um, coffee circles, and, and game day, again, another social component, but again, it's, it's an opportunity that, you know, through these, different things, you know, just sitting around drinking coffee or, or having a game day and playing bridge or dominoes or cards, what have you. Um, it's a chance for them to, to connect with someone. Um, and in doing so, it makes them much more likely that, you know, um, maybe if they receive that invite to a group exercise class or to go, you know, go play some racquetball or what, whatever the case, they're, they're probably much more likely to say yes. So I, I think, you know, again, there's no perfect, um, prescription or, or formula as far as how how to kind of get people motivated but I think just exploring avenues knowing that you know this could be the the, the bridge that, that that kind of brings it together um I just threw senior prom on there just really because that's just it's, it was a, a really fun experience and it's something fun that we do um and knowing that everyone again responds a little differently so we modeled after a high school prom um we uh throw in some Motown or if you and if you want something a little bit newer we have some earth wind and fire for you uh, but we'll throw that on and, and people get down and it's a it's a really, really fun time. It gets people smiling and it gets them moving, uh, which is important. Some people, they don't want to exercise, right? Uh, but they'll dance and little do they know that dance is exercise. Um, so uh, and then the other thing uh, or another thing that we do is um, our youth fit program. So, again, this is our onboarding. So when they come in and they do make that step and they, um, you know, they enter and, and we get them scheduled with the coach to be able to sit down with them. Sometimes they come in and, and maybe what they want to do, their plan, it contradicts actually what they want to accomplish. So we, you know, they might not have a plan at all, or maybe they just lack motivation and they're only here because the doctor, spouse, or child told them that they need to be here. So, but our goal and our job is to be able to sit down with them again and partner with them to determine, you know, what's, what do we need to do to, to set them on a path to success? You know, what, what pieces, you know, so kind of give a little, you know, uh, take a little we kind of suggest but then we we kind of um golf what they we let them steer the ship essentially um uh, we make sure that they're going the right the right way um and then um another thing i noticed and i mentioned especially uh, when working with seniors um is you know again it's critical you know to check the judgments you know um at the door and <laughs> i think it's you have to take a cautious approach so that you can ensure safety um uh, but you know you never want to assume any member, any, anyone's limitations, um, you know, based off, you know, your own prejudice or implicit bias that you might have. You know, again, you may have great intentions, but just some of those biases, um, whether you realize it or not, you know, they, uh, they, they mold the way that you might act or, or certain things that you might say. 
even if you have good intentions. So just being really mindful of how you treat that, um, those interactions and how you, you help to support them. Um, I made a note too that I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, can, I we've had 90 year olds in here, like literally 91, 92 um, in the strength training area, just you know pumping the weights, uh, moving around machine to machine. Um, you know, we had marathoners um, that are you know, well in their 70s, some in their 80s. Um, so, I mean, it's it's impressive. So it's very, very important that, you know, again, you don't make any assumptions and, and you know, you dive in with the, with the open mind. Um, some additional um, ways, um, again, is, is group exercise. So there's a quick example of some of the, um, you know, classes and, and class styles that we offer. Um, I think it's important to know, again, that everyone responds differently and everyone has their own interests. You know, Zuma Gold is a class that they can dance in. Um, some people only want to be in the pool, and that's fine. We have a pretty robust pool schedule. So I think it's it's important to be, um, you know, have a variety and be dynamic in your offerings, uh, but also to be balanced. I mean, you know, there's certain things that we know, um, you know, and, and again, even those one-on-one -on -one appointments, you know, we have to be uh, mindful and, and ensuring that we're trying to check all the boxes and encouraging them to check boxes. I've had situations before to where people come in and and they um, they only want to do one thing. Um, they may only want to get in the pool, right? Well, getting in the pool is great, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily do anything to, uh, some of you may know, there's a term called sarcopenia. You know, we lose three to uh, three to five percent of our muscle mass every decade, just the joys of aging. Um, so getting in the pool necessarily doesn't you know, it'll build some muscle and stuff, but it doesn't do the same thing um, as maybe weight bearing strength training would do. You know, um, weight bearing strength training, you know, helps to prevent osteopenia or osteoporosis. You know, again, when you do the load bearing um, activity. And so we, again, we wanna make sure that it's still balanced. So we wanna offer a balanced group exercise class and a balance, eventually work them to a, um, to a um, you know, a balanced routine. Um, just understand at the beginning that it may not look balanced, but know that 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 kind of is the that is the end goal is to get to a balanced routine that and that includes uh, cardiovascular um, flexibility, um, strength training. You know, just a really well rounded routine is the goal. <clears throat> um, a little bit more of how we engage. So um, some of this you you've heard. Um, but you know, we offer. So I guess you know we we realize too that um, you know as as a community based organization and, and have an opportunity. Um, just with the resources that we have and the knowledge that we have at the YMCA, excuse me, there was an opportunity to work with healthcare providers to, to serve as an extension of the work that they're doing. Um, so we know that, you know, um, and I know it's been said that, you know, roughly 20% of healthcare, you know, happens during the visits and, and, you know, with the physicians and whatnot, but the other 80% is environmental. It's what, it's what happens outside of that, those interactions. Um, so, um, you know, as part of that continuum of care, um, you know, our, our goal is to get folks, you know, from their visits and into a program, if, if that's something that, you know, their physician wants to see them in, so that then they can work on the things that they need to be working on uh, in between visits um, versus, you know, a lot of times I think we found that when there's no structure, um, or again, if they're that person that was just told to go to the Y or go somewhere and get into a gym, um, it makes it, it's a little bit, um, uh, I think they're, they're more likely to adhere. Uh, when they're in a program like this, or, or again, as I mentioned, the trials here in a moment, um, then just to, to be on their own. Um, so these are good opportunities. So some of the programs we offer um, are, you know, again, diabetes prevention. Uh, we have a cancer survivorship program. Uh, we have a program that helps folks to, you know, uh, manage their hypertension. Uh, weight, we do uh, weight loss. We have a program for weight loss called Lifestyle 360. And then with fall prevention. And of course, the fall prevention, um, Move for Better Balance is the name of the program. <clears throat> um, this is one that I referenced earlier, and this is one that um, it was a little bit, a little bit scary because uh, this program, in particular, uh, it's a 12-week program that uses Tai Chi-based uh, forms and movements to um, to help folks, you know, with their coordination and balance and core strength, and, and just to obviously prevent a fall. Uh, we were a little bit nervous, but this is one of the ones that we took to virtual. We obviously saw a need, and with the pandemic. Um, you know, there was still a lot of folks that needed the service but didn't want to come out of their home. Um, but we, you know, realized that, you know, it was, it, you know, we, we kind of wanted to determine that it wasn't going to be contraindicated. You know, we want to make sure that the benefits of offering this program virtually would outweigh the risk. So, you know, we made a decision to put some safeguards in place 
Um, you know, we added kind of beefed up some of the things we were doing with that. We added additional instructor to, to make sure, you know, they could watch to make sure folks were being safe. And, you know, we would do assessments ahead of time and look for trip hazards and make sure that you know, everything was set up right. So, you know, by doing that, we were able to adapt and uh, offer this program. And again, um, kind of I'll move into the technology piece in a moment. Uh, some of the reservations we had about virtual and concerns that we had that as far as the success of it, it's been far from that. It's been really, uh, it's been awesome. We were on our sixth session of, sixth or seventh session of virtual. Um, we have waiting lists, so it's gone really, really well. Um, another thing I would note with that too is, you know, with the aging population, you know, falls are obviously on the rise. I looked up a couple of statistics, but with the CDC, um, they report that one in four adults, older adults uh, will fall each year. And then the fall death rates um, uh, have increased in the U.S. Uh, by 30% from 2007 to 2016. So pretty significant increase. Um, and then uh, the other statistic uh, was if uh, rates continue to rise, we can anticipate seven fall deaths uh, every hour by 2030. So I mean, those are pretty significant numbers. So we know that there, again, is a, um, an opportunity um, to you know, increase our ability to be able to offer that program. Um, so we, we continue to put additional resources into it. Um, and then the research trials um, is another way that we've engaged. So again, you're, you're aware of these, but CLIP2 was the one referenced earlier, which again, focused on mobility and older adults and looking at strength training versus um, stretching and, and you know the difference between the two. Excerpt and U.S. Pointer. And, and the one thing I'll say too, and I wanna commend Dr. Baker again, and we're, we're so excited at the opportunity to be partners in research because, you know, I, I, we understand that everything we know, you know, the programs above, those evidence-based programs, they're only evidence-based because of research that went into making those programs. And now we're able to go out and affect, you know, across the, the country and, and everywhere that these programs are offered, thousands and thousands of people uh, with these programs. So we're very, very grateful for the opportunity to be um, a part of this research and then also uh, the ability to work with um, healthcare providers to be able to offer this service. Thank you so much, Mr. Grobel. We, we are way over time, so we, uh, we need to, I think, move on. Uh, I'm so sorry to have to uh, cut you short a little bit, uh, but hopefully in the uh, Q&A at the very end, we can bring out maybe some more of these things. I see you have more of a talk here. Um, and so at this point, I'd like to move on to introduce our final speaker. And um, our final speaker is um, Mrs. Parker. And I'd like to give a little introduction here. Mrs. Jean Parker is a retiree from Lockett Martin. She's a former director of an organization called Priscilla's Lost and Found in Maryland. She was previously a certified nursing assistant for WeCare, Public Beauty Services, and importantly, a caregiver for her deceased husband, John Parker. Mrs. Parker is also the mother of two daughters, five grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. She, she is an encourager of women, and her hobbies include sewing, reading, and bowling, and she's going to share with us the former caregiver perspective. We pull this sort of all together. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I just want to share my personal view with you. Exercise for the caregiver. Exercise clears your mind and gives you a new perspective on things. As a caregiver, you need to rest your mind your soul, and your body. There are many times or many ways that you can do this to energize you. The benefits that you get from exercising is just for you as a caregiver. It allows you to focus on yourself and by no means should you feel guilty for taking a few moments to have some me time. If you are not well, you will not be able to care for your loved one as you would like. And some of the things that you can do or some of the things that I did to help um, as I was taking care of John, I would try deep breathing. 
before I would respond to a question that had been asked of me for about 30 times in the uh, time frame of 15 minutes. It will allow you to collect your thoughts before giving your loved one a harsh response. Try just taking a deep breath. There are small movements that give big results, such as flexing your shoulders and rotating your, you know, your ankles while you're sitting, simply bending from side to side in the chair releases stress and breaks the monotony. Going out for a run if you're able to find a few moments to yourself. Becoming one with nature, just taking time to look around you and to breathe. Listening to your favorite music, which helps to drown out the noise around you. While shopping, take a stroll rather than walk rapidly through the aisles and think of things that bring you joy. Journaling helps a lot, it really, really does. I have an instance where I go back from time to time over three years ago, um, just to take a look at things um, when um, John was still alive and how I handled things. And there were times when I had to ask for forgiveness for my responses. You have to remember that it's not your loved one, it's the disease. So the responses that they give sometimes, they may throw you. <laughs> um, but just rest assured that you're doing the best that you can as a caregiver. Um, a lot of times, take, talking to somebody else who has uh, a similar circumstance, someone who can share your story, that really helps a lot. Just talking as a facilitator for the Alzheimer's Association, I facilitate a class for caregivers. And uh, there are times when people come in and they say uh, they really don't want anybody to know that their loved one has dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, take that burden off of yourself and don't be afraid to share with others. Dementia is much more prevalent now than it ever was. And from time to time, it's going to touch uh, almost every family. So don't be afraid to share. The time that you spend to, with yourself, ask your, um, your family members. Don't try to take the burden all on yourself if you can help it. Share with family members, share with friends. Allow people to come into your space to help you with your loved one. You need time to rest. And um, that's really the best advice that I can get for caregiver. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have come to the conclusion of our presentations and uh, that gives us the opportunity